Big thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. If you saw my previous ground effect video, you'll remember that we got this little foamy chrono plan working fairly well. It uses a little LiDAR rangefinder chip to help control its altitude while close to the ground. This worked by using the rangefinder reading to automatically control the throttle. As the aircraft would get closer to the ground, the throttle would increase, and as it would get further from the ground, the throttle would decrease. This worked really well in calm conditions with few disturbances, but with any amount of breeze, it would get tossed around quite a bit. In this video, Sebastian and I set out to improve performance by adding a more complex control loop as well as utilizing the elevator and flaps for altitude control in addition to the throttle. Then we have some fun with a fog machine to try and visualize what's going on with the aerodynamics. Before we get into all that, let's address some of the common questions people had about the previous video. First up, what's the point? The answer is simple. Flying low and fast is really cool. From a more practical perspective, Flying in the ground effect can increase the efficiency of an aircraft. That's why birds do it. We'll do some experiments to try and prove that in a little while. The next question was, if the aircraft is actually in ground effect, why do you need a rangefinder to control the altitude? I'm gonna break this one into two parts. So first of all, how do we know it's actually in ground effect? There's a common rule of thumb in aviation that says the aircraft is in ground effect whenever its altitude is less than half of the length of a wingspan. In this case, our wingspan is 34 inches, so the vehicle is always experiencing some amount of ground effect whenever it is less than 17 inches high. What we don't really know is how much of an effect the ground effect actually has on the vehicle. The next part is, why do you need a LiDAR rangefinder if it's really in ground effect? Well, in a perfect world, we wouldn't need one. Going in and out of ground effect is a negative feedback loop, which means it should be a self-stabilizing system. As an aircraft gets closer and closer to the ground, its wing generates more and more lift, which makes it want to rise away from the ground. If everything is constant, it should find an equilibrium point somewhere in between, and just stay there. In super calm conditions, it's really easy to keep this little ecrono plan in the ground effect. Once you find the right throttle setting, it just stays nice and low on its own. The problem is, it's rarely perfectly calm outside, and small lightweight aircraft like this are squirrely and much more difficult to control than larger aircraft. So it's nice to have a rangefinder and an altitude control loop to help out, especially in breezy conditions. Larger aircrafts are more docile and can plow through disturbances more easily. Okay, moving on to our new control loop. In the last video, we were using a simple proportional controller on the throttle. This would simply change the throttle proportionally to the distance sensor reading. Although it worked well in calmer conditions, the control system was not quite responsive enough to work well in turbulent conditions. This time around, the first thing we tried was a full PID controller on the throttle. This really didn't improve things much. The fact of the matter is that controlling the altitude of the vehicle with the throttle has a pretty sluggish response because you have to accelerate and decelerate the whole thing to get any change in airspeed and lift. At this point, it was clear we needed more control authority, so Sebastian added new control loops for the elevator and spoilerons. This is Sebastian's preferred software writing environment of choice in the curb next to the gravel parking lot. This is all being done in ArduPilot, so we can tune these control loops by changing the ArduPilot parameters, just like you would for configuring any other drone. First, let's focus on the spoileron control. You might be wondering what a spoileron is. Basically, it's a spoiler and an aileron combined. It's what you get when you put both ailerons up to reduce lift. So in our control loop, when the aircraft rises, the spoilerons go up to hopefully reduce lift and bring the aircraft back down. Once implemented, this seemed to work fairly well. But if there was too much spoiler movement, the aircraft would pitch back and kind of do a weird porpoising motion. It also reduced the aileron control, which led to some sketchy moments in flight. Oh, oh he almost killed the intern. You lose, uh, lose roll control with flaps only. Oh. Wow. Next, we tried elevator control. As the aircraft would rise, the elevator would pitch the aircraft down. As the aircraft would approach the ground, the elevator would pitch the aircraft up. This method seems to work pretty well, but it does have one downside. If you're solely relying on the pitch to control the altitude, the airspeed can get out of hand and cause issues. Let's assume we're cruising along at a fixed throttle level and using only the elevator to control the altitude. All is well and the aircraft is flying at its most efficient angle of attack. But suddenly, you launch a missile off the top and now the aircraft is lighter. What will happen is the aircraft now has to pitch down a bit to reduce its total lift. But since the throttle is fixed, the aircraft will now speed up and be flying faster than its most efficient speed. Now let's consider the opposite. If we add weight to the aircraft, the pitch will have to be increased in order to generate more lift. Increasing the pitch also increases drag, which slows the aircraft down. 
Slowing the aircraft down reduces lift, which will cause it to descend, which will increase the pitch. This repeats over and over, and pretty soon you'll stall and hit the ground. We can also think about this as an energy problem. As we increase weight, increasing pitch alone won't help us, because the aircraft ultimately needs more energy to stay aloft. So we really need some throttle control as well, to add and remove energy from the system, and help keep the airspeed in check. I was using payload weight as an example here, but these disturbances could also come from flying through turbulence, slope angle of the ground, or really anything. Back to our beloved foam Ekronoplan. After lots and lots of tuning, I found that a combination of throttle, elevator, and a little bit of spoiler on gave the best performance. Sebastian also implemented I and D controllers on the elevator and spoiler ons, but these didn't seem to help much at all. I put this dumpster lid here to input a disturbance in the control loop and see how the flight controller would respond. A few times it seemed to work pretty well, but other times it just acted like a kicker. Even with a decent amount of breeze, it still does a fairly good job of staying close to the ground. You can see it fighting harder against the turbulence with its flaps and elevator. Oh baby! Hell yeah! That's pretty good! <laughs> he hit his car! Now, in the ground effect video series, you've crashed into your car and I've crashed into my car. No damage to anything, I don't think. That's pretty funny. I even tried this new firmware on the old Airfish model that didn't work with only proportional throttle control. And thanks to a little bit of elevator p-term, it actually sort of worked, but just barely. It was still very unstable on the pitch axis. <laughs> it works! Sick! <laughs> <laughs> Oopsies! Tokyo Drift! That's awesome! Now back to the other airframe. After I had tuned the vehicle the best I could, my friends and I set out to try and visualize what is really going on when an aircraft is in the ground effect. We got Banji here with the Freefly Wave high speed camera. We got Sebastian on the fog machine button. I found this fog machine on Craigslist and I emailed the guy, his name is Wayne. And he was like, dude, I watched your videos and they're pretty sick. And then he gave it to me for free. So thanks Wayne. And then we got a Stratus LEDs 10 module array right here. This is 1.2 kilowatts of LED power running off a bunch of lipos. And we're gonna shoot some wingtip vortexes. Sick. That was great. Right off the bat, we were able to see the wingtip vortexes. I was hoping that we would be able to see how the vortexes made closer to the ground were smaller and less powerful than the ones made higher up. This would be a telltale sign of more efficient flight close to the ground, but I really wasn't able to notice a difference in the vortex strength. The only one really obvious difference is that the downwash from higher altitude goes straight down and the vortexes stay about the same distance apart. When in the ground effect, the downwash spreads way out to the sides, and the vortexes move away from each other. In my last ground effect video, I talked about how flying low effectively lengthens the wingspan of the aircraft, and I think that's kind of what we're seeing here. trigger their outdoor smoke alarm. Now a word about the sponsor of this video, Skillshare. If you're anything like me, you probably love learning new skills, and I'd bet you'd also love Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives where millions come together to take the next steps in their creative journey. Skillshare offers thousands of inspiring classes for creatives and curious people on topics including illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, and more. Here's a cool class I found by Justin Bridges about DSLR cameras. The skills taught here can help you learn to make your own videos just like this one. Whether you're a dabbler or a pro, a hobbyist or a maker, 
you're creative. It's curated specifically for learning, which means no ads, and they're always launching new premium classes, so you can follow wherever your creativity takes you. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click on the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare, so you can start exploring your creativity today. Now back to the video. Did we figure out what the siren was? I have no idea what that was. Oh, oh well. Whoa! Oh, that's so good. Wow, it's directly head on. Sorry. Oh, Looks like fun. Yeah. It wasn't until I started getting darker that the really tight vortexes began to appear. At first I thought they were only happening close to the ground, but after looking back at some of the higher altitude footage, it was clear they were happening there as well. Can you go give us a little bit of light, Russ? Yeah. Just a little, Russ. Oh. Just a twinge. Whoa, dude, it's like a freaking tentacle that reaches out of the cloud. That is so sick. That is so sick. After that, I set out to try and measure and increase in efficiency from flying in the ground effect. I was too lazy to install a power meter in the flight controller, so instead I just glued on an LED current display and an Insta360 GO2 camera onto the top of the aircraft. The current meter maxed out at 10 amps, and I was pulling more than that with the 2-cell battery I started with, so I had to switch to a 3-cell battery to drop the current down low enough. I did a series of passes both in and out of ground effect and wrote down the current every 10 video frames. After averaging them all together, it turned out the aircraft pulled 6.1% more current while flying out of ground effect. Admittedly, this was a pretty lousy test, and I also later realized that in order to really calculate the efficiency, we would also need to know the airspeed. I'll try more efficiency measurements in the next episode. The next night, we set out to capture more of those sweet, sweet vortexes. Today we're trying to build a chiller, which is the name for a box full of cold things that you blow a fog machine into fog machine as you can see here. So we're gonna fill this box full of dry ice, blow fog into it, and hope that it cools the fog off enough to stay on the ground rather than floating all through Banji's nostrils like you're seeing now. I wanna put the dry ice on top of this plastic so that it has a little bit of insulation down low. And then I'm gonna take this here hammer and break it. Now this is not optimal. We should be trying to increase the surface area more. But, we're, uh, well, that's the best we can do. So now we'll close this up. We'll stick a fog machine right in this hole in the box. Ready, set, go. Shit. <laughs> it's, it's going low! Oh, it's working! Sort of, barely. Maybe we just need more. Oh, there we go. That looks pretty chilled. It's a very inefficient fog chiller, but it kind of works. I would expect it to shoot out that way more, but it doesn't seem to be doing that. Well, maybe we'll just have to uh, fly really close to the box.
What's up, guys? I'm Dumpster Fire Dan. Jesus, where did that go? No idea. The fog chiller really didn't work out, but we still got a few cool clips. We were getting fewer of those super tight vortexes this night, probably because it was a little bit more breezy and the air was just more turbulent. That's all for this video. In the next episode, I'm doing a collaboration with Kevin from the YouTube channel ThinkFlight. I'm going to try putting LiDAR altitude control on this awesome amphibious ground effect vehicle that he built, so stay tuned. Thanks for watching, bye.